It's a slice of daily life at this busy Toronto restaurant. How was your week? Not bad. Hi, Barbara. You're going to. They're good. Everybody's okay. A gathering place for many in the local Jewish community where good food and conversation go hand in hand, where the local ladies like to lunch, and where the federal finance minister likes to take a break as well. Well, there's a familiar face, Mr. Oliver. Nice to see you. How are you? Joe Oliver may look relaxed, but there's no denying he has had one of the toughest and most stressful jobs going. He's been the finance minister for the last year and a half, helping steer the country out of the last recession and confident that Canada is now well behind the latest downturn as well. Are we out of that technical recession? Um, well, we definitely are not in a recession. Um, the month of June was up 0.4%. Uh, uh, we're up again, 0.3% uh, in, in July. What's up? The economy, GDP, is up, increased from month to month. So uh, what we're talking about is an economy that is growing, and every single major economist that I have spoken to, as well as the Bank of Canada, the IMF, and the OECD, all say that we're going to have pretty solid growth in the second half of the year and growth for the full year. So, uh, yeah, there's no, uh, there's no recession. At the age of 75, Oliver is ready for yet another political run. The Harvard-educated former investment banker was first elected in 2011, winning by more than 4,000 votes and ending what was more than three decades of liberal rule in the riding. But this time, a conservative win may not be that easy. Still, Oliver is hopeful and says he's worked hard. Are you proud of the economic record? Yes, I'm very proud of the economic record. We went through the worst recession since the Great Depression. We, it hit us a little bit later than most countries. It affected us less deeply. We emerged from it more, in better shape. And we've created 1.3 million net new jobs, better than other countries. Uh, we have a lower debt uh, to GDP, half that of the G7 average. And our economy is on the move. Uh, we've balanced our budget last year. Uh, we have $5.2 billion in surplus this year so far in the first four months. So we're well on the way to a balanced budget again. Our trade numbers are, are starting to, to get there. And uh, job creation is increasing. Consumer confidence is, is up. Well, we're very pleased with the job he's done, and we plan to vote for him in the next this election. And we want to keep uh, Prime Minister Harper as our Prime Minister because we feel he's been excellent in our economy and Support for Israel. Um, a good friend of Israel. And we don't want to see either of the uh, other, either Mulcair or, or Justin Trudeau because. We're also talking international, on the international stage as a prime minister, and to see either of them would be a disaster. Some woman said to me, um, I'm going to vote for Trudeau. I came to Canada when his father was prime minister, and I liked him. I said, what did you like about him? That, and why, I mean, I, don't compare him to his, don't compare his son to him, because at least, at least his father was had a you know background, but you're talking Justin Trudeau, who was a drama teacher, going to be on the international stage. So when I finished with her, she said, "Oh, I think you're right." <laughs> Joe Oliver and Stephen Harper's conservatives may be an easy sell to some, but there are also some strong opponents challenging Oliver in this economically diverse community. I'm the only candidate that lives in Eglinton Lawrence. I think that's actually pretty important. The Midtown Toronto riding includes several well-to-do pockets like Forest Hill and Lawrence Park. But there are also some lower income pockets here and much of the riding of Eglinton Lawrence is middle class. Canadians are ready for change in this riding that means voting for Liberal. And you know Oliver's main challenger is 42-year-old Liberal Marco Mendocino, the Toronto lawyer and former Crown attorney who helped successfully prosecute the Toronto 18 terrorist cell. You helped take down the Toronto 18 terrorist yes. cell, ready to take down a federal finance minister? I mean, that's what's at stake. Well, absolutely, and that's why we're working as hard as um, we are. Look, what's at stake is um, our people's lives, whether or not um, you can continue to work hard and pursue a better life. That's uh, what brought my family here. That's what 
brought many families to Canada. And I realize how, how fragile that concept is, and that's what drives me every day. That and the fact that I, I genuinely care about this community. The riding is diverse. It has one of the highest Jewish populations in the country, but the Italian-speaking contingent is large as well. And with a name like Mendicino, it brings instant support. I think we're going to go with Mark Mendicino. Uh, he's new, he's young, he's got some good ideas. I'm a member of this community. I can speak with more authenticity and legitimacy about how federal priorities impact people's day-to-day -day lives in Eglinton Lawrence. Um, and because I understand how fragile the concept of pursuing a better life in Canada is. Um, we're competing against a global economy. Um, there are certain um, instabilities in the world. We're going to meet those head on. And I believe in a confident and an ambitious and also a compassionate Canada. Mendocino is also relying on support from residents who may like Joe Oliver personally, just not the party he represents. Have you thought about how you might vote for the election? Um, voting for... My daughter wants us to vote liberal. Liberal. How liberal. come? Because she doesn't want the conservatives to get in, and the uh, NDP has no chance. But Andrew Morning. Thompson's here to tell residents they have another choice as well. Good morning. Thumbel Care is in a good position to form a, uh, a new government, and I think it's good to, to uh, replace Mr. Here. Harper. 48-year-old is a former Saskatchewan finance minister running for the NDP, who thinks he's got the platform people want with the economic credentials to match. Some are, you know, calling this the battle of the two finance mm. ministers. Are you good with that? I'm fine with that. And I think there are two very different views of what we should be doing with the federal budget. Uh, certainly, uh, we know what the Conservative plan has been. We know it's not been working. Our approach is a balanced one, but a lot more investment back into people and programs. And I think that that's a, you know, a fundamental difference. Does the NDP have a shot here? When's the last time the NDP won in this riding? Well, it's been a while. You go back into the 90s. Uh, but, I mean, this is a campaign that I feel there's a lot of interest in what the NDP is talking about here. And people are very glad to see the NDP back on the doorstep. The chances of the NDP winning here are further complicated by groups like the Animal Alliance, who despite being small in numbers, is hoping to make a big impact. We're not uh, uh, really uh, trying to defeat or uh, elect any, uh, anybody else but, but the candidate for this, this riding. But we, well, our main concern, main hope is that we can influence other politicians to adopt some of our policies. Which are? Which are... Uh, what Animal Alliance Environment Voters stands for is uh, we want to see human progress, but we want it to be just, uh, equitable and sustainable for, uh, to uh, the environment and the animals and plants that share our world with us. The Alliance may have a harder sell in this relatively affluent riding, though, where the average family income is over $165,000 a year in the top 25% nationally. And this election, it is all about the money. When the economy is still issue number one, the finance minister knows just how well Canada has done economically is directly linked to his chances of re-election. And some suggest the economy is still struggling. When they talk about uh, a, a decrease in projections, they're talking about a decrease in the growth projections. So... Th that, that doesn't but that's mean not the economic news, though. No, right? but, uh, well, look, the, the, the numbers on, on trade really reflected uh, the decrease in exports of energy. That's what it was about. It was overwhelmingly energy. Everything else was moving. And, you know, in the first half of the year, but the decline... we rely on energy in our economy. Well, that's a big chunk of what this well, country was built on, the reliance on those oil exports, right? So well, can okay, you dismiss the, it no, as I, just a no, portion? No, no, I don't, I don't dismiss it, but it's less than 10%. Others accuse the Harper government of trading government debt for consumer debt, a house of cards, some say, that could quickly collapse. Mr. Harper's encouraging home ownership. 700,000 new homeowners by 2020. Yet, on the flip side, this government's also done things to temper an overheated housing market. So, is the government at odds with itself on that? No. And how concerned are you about a possible housing collapse that could affect the Canadian economy and consumers, voters, directly? Well, we don't believe, as I said many times, that there is a bubble. Um, and, you know, in agreement with us uh, are, is, is the bank, uh, the government of the Bank of Canada, uh, the IMF, uh, the OECD again, and private sector economists. So we're not uh, we're not alone in in this regard. However, as you pointed out, we did take steps to take the froth out of the real estate market. 
Now we're we're dealing with a market that's that's overall in Canada not moving. At a, uh, the prices aren't really going up except for two cities, Vancouver and Toronto. So we're watching that very carefully, uh, of course. If oil prices remain low, is Canada still in trouble? What's going to fuel our growth? Well, we have a highly diversified economy, happily. Uh, oil is part of it. Even at l these low prices, there's still uh, economic benefit to, to the development of our, of, our, of our oil and gas. And we'll continue to do that. There's a market for it. There's a market in the United States, and there's a market around the world. Um, so we, we mustn't we mustn't despair about about that or be excessively excessively pessimistic. But we had this historic TPP deal, uh, the largest trade deal in the world, certainly the largest in Canada. We're talking about 800 million customers in total, 40% uh, of the global economy, 28 billion dollars in, in GDP. Uh, explain that. How's that going to trickle down and, and create jobs and help the economy? And when would those jobs be created? We're hearing a number of 1.3 million by 2020. But we're also hearing that it'll take years for that to see the results of that deal trickle through. Well, I, I wouldn't characterize it as trickling through. I think the, as soon as the deals are signed in each of the countries and, and implemented, ratified by, by their legislatures or, or parliaments, um, then I think you know, the trade barriers are removed and the advantages start accruing immediately. In the meantime, companies will be anticipating the increased uh, consumption uh, the, the greater demand, international demand, and in a number of cases they're going to start planning uh, for that, and that may mean uh, uh, capital expenditures but and hiring. it could take years to get those jobs, right? Well, some of the jobs could, could happen uh, more, more quickly than that, but, but look, we, <laughs> this, is, this is a big deal, and when you have something that immense, you don't necessarily expect it to, to, uh, to start instantly. The alternative would have been very dire indeed. The TPP is a massive trade deal, one the Liberals have said they'd support, but... One of the things that we've been very critical of the uh, Conservatives of doing is negotiating this deal um, in the midst of an election um, and not being transparent uh, with Canadians and with um, the manufacturing sector and with agricultural sectors on what the fine print of this deal is going to say. And I can assure you that I'm going to be going over it with a very fine tooth comb as, uh, along with Mr. Trudeau and the rest of our caucus to be sure that this deal is in the best interest of all of Canada. And Marco Mendicino says he has other plans as well. You're making an economic sell against a federal finance minister. That's got to be a little tough. Well, it's not in the present uh, circumstances because he has a very poor track record. He's presided over the worst period of economic growth in over 80 years. Um, they've run seven straight deficits. Uh, he talks about having balanced the budget this year. But I think Canadians uh, know how that budget got balanced. He balanced it by selling GM shares to the... Uh, to the tune of a $750 million loss. He balanced it by dipping into a rainy day fund, and that's not really a, an authentic surplus. What are you hearing at the door? Are voters challenging you? What's the number one issue? What's the conversation been like? Fatigue with Mr. Harper. Um, the vast majority of Canadians that I'm speaking to are done with Mr. Harper's divide-and-conquer style of politics. Um, there isn't a, an issue that he can't find to divide one uh, Canadian from another. Um, it used to be we j used to just debate about policy and... Uh, with Mr. Harper and wedge Canadians in that in that respect, and now he's elevated it to citizenship, um, and that's obviously I think um, a deliberate tactic uh, in the last stages of uh, the election, which is very regrettable. Um, and uh, I think Canadians are going to reject it uh, for what it is, which is inciting fear and intolerance. Some are calling this battle the battle of the two finance ministers. Of course, the NDP candidate uh, Saskatchewan finance minister formerly, and Joe Oliver, of course. What's a lawyer doing in this race? Well, a lawyer in this race lives in the community. And as for the uh, rhetoric that, uh, and the line that you just mentioned, look, the NDP historically and today are not a factor in this race. I think all of the polls bear that out. Um, the majority, the vast, vast majority of individuals I've spoken with didn't know who uh, the NDP candidate was. Um, I'm focused on defeating Joe Oliver. The NDP candidate is also focused on Joe Oliver. So how are you doing? I'm great. You? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing You're well. You're in that home stretch now, right? Yeah, Ten that's more right. days, so yeah. it's all good? Yeah, it's all good. In fact, on this day, he's campaigning just a few feet away. What's the pitch well, here? Yeah. For well, right here, of course, we're talking infrastructure because these are people who are taking public transit. The NDP also has one eye on Mendicino. What do you think of your liberal challenger here and the liberal plan for the economy? 
Well, it's very hard to tell what the Liberal plan for the economy is beyond their um, uh, suggestion that there would be more infrastructure spending. But when you actually dig into the details of it, they said they'd run large deficits to stimulate through infrastructure, but less than half the money they're talking about borrowing is going to actually going to go to that. So this, they, you know, it's very typical of the Liberals. The plan changes every 15, 20 minutes. What do you make of the challenger, Mr. Mendicino? I mean, I haven't really uh, run across uh, the, the Liberals much. I mean, they're obviously putting up a fight, as are we uh, in the riding. I mean, I think there is a, this has been a traditionally uh, liberal riding over the years. Uh, I haven't noticed a huge amount of growth uh, in terms of the Liberal vote. I think what's at, at play is whether the Conservative vote is uh, soft and where that's going to go. What is the economic plan for the country from the NDP? What we're saying is that there's been a lot of focus on the resource sector over the last decade. We now need to put that focus back on the traditional growth engines here in Ontario, manufacturing, innovation, technology. All of those uh, need to have additional support, as well as obviously putting support into small business by cutting the tax rate. Most of the jobs that are created right now are created in small business. But with both the Liberals and Conservatives promising billions of federal investment dollars to make Toronto's Smart Track transit plan happen, Many wonder why the NDP's Thomas Mulcair has not committed to the same. So we are committing uh, to the city uh, stable funding. This will be predictable. They'll be able to undertake whatever plan they want. One of the problems we've got here in Toronto is that council often changes its direction. Uh, our emphasis is saying it's not up to the federal government to tell you where to spend the money. Here is the money. Let's get on with it. And that's really been the approach of the NDP. So the total taking. commitment the NDP should Thomas Mulcair become Prime Minister is committing what to transit in the city of Toronto? 1.6 billion over four years. When you were Finance Minister in Saskatchewan, when you actually cut taxes, now you're you know, representing the NDP who's looking at raising some taxes. How do you um, square with that? Well, we've always been about rebalancing the taxes. I mean, our priority right now is to keep taxes relatively low for individuals, and we're asking the larger corporations to pay a little bit more. Uh, so the tax rate will move back to, for corporations, what it was only five years ago. Uh, this isn't an onerous ask by any means. The other thing is, in Saskatchewan, obviously what we were looking at was a uh, reduction in corporate taxes um, on capital. This is not as big of an issue federally. Uh, and so we're f more committed to actually making the, the priority around uh, allowing industry and manufacturing to retool through special incentives to support them. You said before, though, that you're a strong believer in Canada's resource-based economy. Mm -hmm. Um, Joe Oliver obviously is, the Conservatives are, in fact they say that's what helps fund our social programs. It does. No, no, this isn't an either or. What we're saying is we need to have both. I mean we need to continue to make sure that the resource sector is strong. There's a lot of jobs, a lot of GDP uh, growth, a lot of export potential there. We need to make sure the rest of the economy is functioning too. One of the problems we have with the Conservatives is they put all the eggs in one basket. We need to go back to make sure that as the cyclical downturn happens in oil, as it always does, we can step back up by seeing strength in Ontario's manufacturing sector. This has been neglected over the last decade. 400,000 fewer manufacturing jobs, 20,000 fewer manufacturing firms. That's hollowed out. We've got to get that going again. Not only has Joe Oliver taken some heat over the economy, but his critics say he never should have agreed to speak before an exclusive men's only club in the riding, especially when they allege he's been missing in action for at least the first half of this campaign. My primary objective as is every candidate's objective during an election, is to speak to their electors. And that's, of course, what I'm doing, but not to the exclusion of my, my ministerial responsibilities. That's why I took four days off from the campaign to go to, to Turkey to the G20 meeting. What about the men's club? Speak, speaking well, to a men's only club, has well, that maybe offended some women? Do you think some women in the riding well, might say, I'm not going to vote for you? Nobody has said that. First of all, I, I spoke at Verity. Didn't seem to be a problem. That's, that's a woman's club. And, you know, Olivia Chow, George Smitherman, John Tory all spoke at, uh, at the, the, this health club. Uh, why the double standard? I, I leave to others to, to explain. Joe Oliver has not been here for the last four years. He can trot out all of the statistics that he wants. Uh, that but he has been the federal finance minister. Hang on, he's, he's been busy. He still has an obligation to be accessible to his constituents. And whether it's on issues related to affordable housing, and I have canvassed those doors um, in communities which are suffering, they haven't seen him, or whether it's on issues like the refugee cr crisis, I beg your pardon, um, where we have a very um, active community organization that has looked for help from him, he's just not been there. Have you seen Joe at all? Does he come to your door? Or? No. He hasn't. Well, I'm hearing that a fair bit as well. But if he did, does show up at your door, 
in the next 11 days before polls close on October 19, I think you could come right back at him and you could ask him, how many times have you promised balanced budget before? How many times have you actually delivered on that? And even if it is your platform this time around, is it what is best for this community in the present circumstances? If Oliver has been less visible on the doorstep, observers suggest the latest polls may be the reason, suggesting Canada's finance minister may be in a fight for his political life. Are you concerned that you could lose your seat possibly? Well, I never take the voters of Eglinton Lawrence for granted. Uh, we, uh, we feel pretty good, but we're going to be continue. We're going to continue to be out there uh, canvassing, talking to people. I want to ask you what this campaign's been like for you, going door to door. Um, you know, people open their door and there's a finance minister. <laughs> and they say what? What's their first reaction? Well, um, those who recognize me say, oh, that's great. Uh, thank you for coming. I I'm really appreciative of uh, the fact that you're here. Uh, we didn't expect to see the finance minister at the door. Uh, and then they may ask me questions about, uh, about it. But, you know, they, they're not into... Uh, the, the arcane technicalities of the economy. Uh, pocketbook issues are the critical number one issue always in, in every campaign, and they're, you know, and they're uh, they're concerned about that, or they're happy about it. As for the man who would defeat Joe Oliver, Mendicino says he's confident he can win despite the negative attack ads being unleashed against his Liberal leader. Look, I think that the majority of Canadians um, see these uh, as tactics um, and very superficial. Um, I, I think that we are thankfully seeing the decline of the effectiveness of the personal attacks on Mr. Trudeau. And one of the things that I admire about him the most is that every time somebody throws a stone at him that, you know, talks about his hair or his family or his father, he immediately pivots back to Canadians and his platform. And I think that that is a sign of a leader who is very focused on what matters, which is how we turn things around. What I think that we hear more often than not from Mr. Harper is an emphasis on negativity and divisiveness and fear. And that's all he has to offer. At this um, very late stage in the election, um, every word of his is carefully calibrated to drum up fear instead of confidence, instead of inclusivity, instead of optimism. And I think that that speaks to the ethos of the style of politics that he has to offer. And there's a sharp contrast there. Mr. Trudeau, on the other hand, remains focused on being confident, on being ambitious, and also on being compassionate. Our platform um, is married to those, those values, the values of offering every Canadian um, an equal opportunity to achieve their full potential. And that's, that's why I'm running. Now, the Liberals created some controversy of their own when Conservative-turned-Liberal MP Eve Adams tried to run here as a candidate. This after alleged misconduct in her own riding of Oakville, Ontario, prevented her from running there. And in the end, it was Marco Mendicino who won the Liberal nomination. Did that create a little bit of division between Liberals? I, I don't think so. I think there, were, there was a lot of passion around uh, the subject, but... Um, you know, in the end, uh, the people of the riding got to pick um, who they felt was the best candidate to take on Joe Oliver. And, you know, I'm very honoured and privileged that they, that they chose me. But if the Eve Adams episode created some tension and division among Liberals themselves, it's clear many Canadians in the riding still see the party as the best option to replace Stephen Harper. Go Jason, go Trudeau, go. Go, go, go Liberals, Mark, go, thank go you Mark, very go, much. Go, Thanks. Yeah. We're getting it done. We're okay. going to get it done. Yeah. Thanks okay. very much. Luck, All the yeah. best. Take care. And back inside that local bakery cafe, some are not afraid to speak their mind. For me, the tar sands issue is one that I have seen uh, the Conservative government supporting financially. The, the development of our resources has been enormously important for financing health care and other social programs. So, you know, that's uh, it has to be balanced. You're absolutely right. Despite his best defense, Canada's finance minister knows it is the bread and butter issues that will decide his fate. Mostly why the main conservative plank of continued corporate tax cuts has failed to produce more jobs. With the decline in the dollar and now the resurgence of the U.S. economy, companies are starting to invest, to take money out of 
totally non-productive savings accounts and putting it into uh, into uh, into capital investment, which of course uh, encourages job creation. And they're doing that because they're more optimistic about the prospects of exporting their goods to the United States in particular. For the first time in, in a very long time, um, Canadians are worried that their children and their future generations are not going to be as well off as they are. And what I want is um, for the things that we've just described. I want Canadians to have an equal opportunity to achieve their full potential. I want uh, there to be gender parity when it comes to wages. You know, I have two daughters. Um, I want them to be able to compete for the same jobs as their male co counterparts. I want uh, there to, for, for families to have the support that they need, especially young families. And some see another possibility for Canada's future, depending on what the election yields. Well, if the Conservatives win, uh, uh, I think the NDP and the Liberals in a coalition could, could take over. Is that a viable option? Well, what, we're, what our objective is is to form government and a majority government. And I believe that that's going to happen with our work ethic. And we'll worry about what happens in a different scenario on in the late hours of October 19th or October 20th. We've been talking to voters in the riding mm -hmm. and you know some voters are suggesting that even if the Conservatives should win a minority government they suggest they'd like to see a Liberal NDP coalition. Is that possible? Well it's not impossible. I think we need to see what the voters uh, provide in terms of a seat count afterwards but there is a very strong uh, desire for change in the country. I hear that here in this riding very much. I think it'll be incumbent upon the parties to figure out a way to work together. Uh, whether that's a formal coalition, whether that's a, a, a legislative agreement, uh, I do think people want to see that change. Now the question is, what are the, the items that would fit into that? Uh, right now, we would have a lot of difficulty with where the Liberals are on a number of issues. Uh, certainly around C-51, we have a problem with them. Uh, on issues uh, around um, uh, their inability to ask the corporations to pay more taxes, we have a difficulty with. There's very little in their program for uh, uh, support for social spending. So we would need to see a number of other items uh, come up. But, you know, the Canadians, this is a great thing about elections. Canadians get to tell the politicians what they want. And I expect after the election, politicians will find out a way to work within that. And our low tax plan for jobs and growth is working. We have to stay the course in a, in a risky, in a risky uh, international environment. We have reduced taxes to where they were 50 years ago. We've balanced the budget. But the Liberals promise are increased taxes and massive deficits. That's not the way to go. Mr. Oliver is a cabinet minister. He's the finance minister. Oh, nice looking. He's one of the tribe. But no go this time. Maybe not this time. Well, maybe we will, maybe we won't. We haven't made a decision yet. For CPAC in the Toronto riding of Eglinton Lawrence, I'm Jacqueline Mulcharic.